Hi guys, welcome back. So this video we're going to be looking at performance enhancing enhancement from a dietary perspective and there's a few things we're going to be looking at but if we look at the key knowledge we want to um, understand by the end of this chapter it's uh, looking at the dietary strategies that can be used to improve performance and recovery and they include a few different things uh, especially the carbohydrate loading, gels, supplementation especially with the protein and caffeine We'll also be looking at different ways you can uh, have different hydration strategies and especially for improving while we're performing and also for recovery. And we look at sports drinks in that. Uh, we also got to be able to discuss the similarities and differences in different ways um, of recovery. And also we're going to be able to critique and kind of work out which is the best method to use in different situations. So we're going to be looking at this chapter from a perspective of three areas. We're going to look at pre-exercise meals, what we can do dietary-wise in terms of during a performance, and also what we can do after the performance to help us recover quicker. So to start off with, we're going to look at pre-exercise meals. So we want to look at these pre-exercise meals as an opportunity to top up our carbohydrate and fluid levels and really be ready to perform at our top. Uh, we want to be, but remember with food, it's only good if it's digested and, and absorbed into the system. So we don't want to be having the high GI foods four hours before because otherwise all that energy will be absorbed quickly and we won't use it straight away when we need it. So a few things we want to think about is we don't want to be having heavy foods that's going to sit in our stomachs and give us stochastic upsets. So the kind of protocols to stick by are three to four hours before an activity. We want to have a meal. One to two hours before the activity, we want to have light snack. And for these two meals and light snacks, we want to have low GI um, foods. The reason for that is because they're going to be absorbed slower, which means they'll be released that energy when we actually need it during exercise. So the whole aim of these meals and light snacks is to, is to increase carbohydrates, but we want to make sure they're also low in fat and moderate in fiber so we don't cause gastric upsets. Anything that's within that for hour before the activity, we should be looking at high GI foods, and also liquid is a good option because it's not going to be sitting in the stomach and also high GI food will be absorbed quickly. Now I think you've all would have heard of carbohydrate loading before, maybe before a big activity. I know before a big ride I might sometimes just go, oh, I'll carb load and have some uh, a big bowl of pasta. But that's not exactly how carbohydrate loading works. It actually requires two changes. It requires a change in your training and also in your diet and what you eat. Um, the whole purpose of this uh, carbohydrate loading is to try and increase the carbohydrate stores in both your liver and your muscles. And um, carbohydrate loading is usually used for athletes who are in endurance events or aerobic events and it's over 90 minutes in duration. So we're not going to see it for basketball or so much. It's going to be for those more marathon um, endurance cyclists, things like that. Uh, the modern day carbohydrate loading pa um, practice includes, as I said, the training and diet changes. So the diet change is a three days before the actual event, you'll have a high carbohydrate diet. And what the high carbohydrate diet means is that you're going to be trying to eat at least seven to 10 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight. So that's the first part. The second part is three to four days uh, before the activity, you'll start tapering your exercise, which simply means you're going to decrease the duration of your activity, but you're going to try and maintain the same intensity. So by doing those two things, you're hopefully going to be able to increase the stores of carbohydrates in your muscles, and it's uh, been proven to show that you can improve improve your performance by about three to five percent before you experience fatigue from uh, switching from carbohydrates to the fats. So carbohydrate loading is really good for pre-activity, pre but post-activity during the recovery with carbohydrates, we want to be looking to get as much carbohydrate into us as possible straight afterwards. So within the first two hours, we want to be trying to get about 50 to 80 grams of high, moderate to high GI foods um, with carbohydrate into us. Uh, if taken immediately within that first hour, um, first hour, half an hour to an hour, we can replicate our performance within 24 hours. If we delay the uptake of that uh, carbohydrate within the first after one to two hours, we, can't, we have to wait about 48 hours before we can repeat the performance. If we wait over three hours, it can take up to 72 hours to be able to repeat the performance. So it's really important that we replenish those stores as quick as possible. 
Maintaining a good level of hydration is really important because if we become dehydrated when we're an athlete, we can suffer some really bad effects which will alter our performance. So we can become confused, not think mentally, not make the right decisions as well. So we're going to look at different varieties of sports drinks and see which ones are best in which situation. So sports drinks are trying to rehydrate us. They're also trying to replace our electrolytes, which will help to improve our muscle contractility and also to refuel our carbohydrate levels. Now in our muscles, we'll actually find a concentration of about 4 to 8% of carbohydrates. So isotonic drinks have the same osmolality as a human body, which means they have, they're very similar and also means they'll be absorbed relatively fast. So isotonic drinks are really good just to have a good, well-balanced drink to make sure we're going to be rehydrated and also refuel those carbohydrate stores. Hypotonic have a low osmolality, which means they have a low, below 4% concentration of carbohydrate, which means they're going to be absorbed really fast. This makes hypotonic drinks really good for people who are wanting to become rehydrated. So especially jockeys, people who are working, maybe it's maybe shorter in, shorter duration activity, but they've lost a lot of sweat. So these people really want to be focusing on those hypotonic drink. The last type of sports drink is hypertonic drinks. These are, have a higher osmolality, which means they've got a higher concentration of carbohydrates above 8%. Uh, these do take longer to absorb and they're generally used post-exercise to aid recovery. The really important thing with hypertonic drinks or any drink or product that has high osmolality is that you should be using these in conjunction with water. This is really important, otherwise you won't get those carbohydrates and the fluid uh, absorbing to the body system quick enough to actually make a difference. So as I said, avoiding dehydration is really important, just as important as rehydrating. So a few things we can do is firstly work on our heat tolerance, so working in environments that we're going to be performing in. Secondly, we can modify our training competition. So that might be changing the time of day that we're going to be working in, maybe changing some rules or uniform restrictions to make it safer for the athletes to perform. Avoiding the heat of the day, so not, not working in the middle of the day if you can help it. Clothing, lightweight, colored, um, loose-fitting materials. So things like cricket down here, where they wear white, obviously that's going to be able to reflect the sun more, not being absorbing those ha- on that heat. Also, drink regularly before and post-exercise. So all the fluid that you lose during an activity, you should also um, you should make sure that you're recovering throughout drinking regularly and drinking before you actually feel like you're dehydrated. So what's the best way to rehydrate? Is it oral or is it intravenous? So firstly, oral is just drinking. IV is actually when it's uh, put straight into your veins, so like a drip through a saline solution. So the biggest advantage of IVs over oral is that there's no gastric upset and uh, you don't feel like your stomach's full. But IV is actually banned in a number of sports. So there's AFL and NRL. They're banned within 24 hours before and during a game. And uh, it's make, the difficulty is that you don't want to have it just done anywhere because it is a sterile. You need to be done in a sterile environment. So it's really important it's done properly by a proper medical official. So there seems to be no benefit to doing IV for the mildly hydrated, but for those who are severely dehydrated, obviously an intravenous, um, intravenous infusion is going to be very beneficial for them. Important to note though that in 2006, the IV infusion was prohibited as an ergogenic method by WADA. Carbohydrate gels are a great inclusion for any athlete, especially endurance athletes who are over six, working for over 60 minutes when they've got to consider carbohydrate depletion as an issue that they need to deal with. So the great advantage that carbohydrate gels have over the drinks is that they're small and lightweight, which means makes them easy to carry around, especially for a cyclist in their back pocket, really easy to get to. Really important though, as they're a hypertonic uh, structure or format, You need to make sure that whenever you have a carbohydrate gel, you're also having it with water. That will help to absorb that carbohydrate quicker, therefore making it more useful for use during activities. So we're now going to look at performance enhancing supplements. And these supplements are any addition to a person's regular diet to achieve a particular nutritional goal. And they might be natural or synthetic product, but supplements uh, supplements are available in fluids, powders, powders or solid food formulations. Uh, But it's really important before you make a decision to use any of these supplements, athletes and coaches need to work together 
and they need to work out the right balance for their performance, and they need to make sure the positive gains will outweigh the negative side effects, which could be costs and also the risk of compromising anti-doping tests. So a lot of these supplements will be made in places where also other drugs are made. So it's really important that there's going to be a guarantee that there's not going to be, not going to be any cross-contamination. So the first supplement we're going to look at is the caffeine. So caffeine stimulates the central nervous system and it's actually a stimulant. It's believed to have a glycogen sparing effect, which enables more fat to be used as a fuel early on, which also then reduces or postpones muscular fatigue. It also stimulates respiration, increases urine production, and improves muscular contractility. And it's thought that by someone having just two cups of coffee can improve a 1,500 meters running performance by four seconds, improve kicking speed at the end of a 1,500 meter race by 3%. So those small changes might be the difference between winning and losing. Uh, Caffeine ingested during exercise does not increase an athlete's risk of dehydration. And the athlete, for best results, wants to have that caffeine pre-match and also keep the level below 3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight as it's been shown to show that excess caffeine above that will have little benefit. The next supplement we're looking at is creatine. So creatine is an amino acid that's found in fish and meat naturally. And it's really popular with sports people who require explosive power. It's been reported on numerous occasions to increase muscular strength and power. Uh, it's combined, if combined with a high carb diet, it's going to lead to greater post exercise glycogen uptake, which means we'll be able to recover faster. The theory is that the supplementation increases PC stores, which aids a quicker buffering of ATP, leading to a greater resynthesis of ATP, which means we can get that energy faster as well. There are, however, a few side effects associated with excess use of creatine supplementation, and they include gastro, gastrointestinal upsets tendon injuries, headaches, kidney problems, muscle cramps, and fluid retention. So it means if you're planning to use creatine as a supplement in your supplementation program, you need to be making sure that you're having the right amounts. Two ways you can do it is a chronic or a long-term loading, which includes 28 days of just having three grams a day. Or you could do acute or short-term, where in five days you have four or five gram doses a day, which will increase that creatine as well. The final supplement we're going to look at now is protein. So this is used again by athletes who want to look at improving their power and strength, especially within their skeletal muscles. Uh, Proteins are really important in terms of constructing and repairing muscles to promote glycogen resynthesis, to boost our immune system, and also promotes and increases resynthesis of hemoglobin, myoglobin, and oxidative enzymes, which is really important for those aerobic activities as well. Uh, so excess proteins are removed, however, in the urea. So again, it's no point having over what we actually need to have. So there are different levels that different athletes should have. If you're a resistance athlete, 1 to 1.6 to 1.7, so you want to have a high protein intake uh, to repair those muscles. Endurance athletes will have a bit lower, but both of those are way above what's recommended just for an average everyday person. Few different types of protein powder as well, but the whey isolate protein powder is of the highest quality. As with carbohydrates, it's really important to make sure we're replenishing our protein stores after activity. So, and drinks are often a good way to do that as well. Also, if an if an athlete's been performing for over ninety minutes, a carbohydrate protein mix is also a good idea. So you're getting both of those supplements back into your body quickly. Well, I hope you found this a summary of this chapter pretty helpful, guys. Some things to do at home now just to help to consolidate your information, the information you've heard here is to go away and think of for the following sports, outline the dietary considerations you'd have to think about for before, during, and post-activity. And this is something you might expect to see in a SAC or an exam to think about what different people might do. So think about what a marathon runner might do beforehand. So would they carbohydrate load and how would they carbohydrate load? Would they have to replenish their carbohydrate stores as they go? And how, what hydration plan would they have? Which type of drinks would they have? And then post at the marathon, what would they be eating? How much would they be eating? And when would they be eating? So think about those, those things for these three areas and then uh, try and write out a response for that. All the best, guys. See you later.